All right, go ahead, Mayor Joe. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Mayor Joe Kalmick from the city of Seal Beach. And with the, me as co-host today is John Peake, the mayor of the city of Cyprus. And our special guest is Senator Tom Umber, our state senator from District 34. And we're gonna be asking some questions and uh, hopefully get some uh, very informative answers from the Senator. So we'll start out uh, with the first question, uh, Senator Umber. Uh, first of all, thanks for joining us today. We appreciate that very much. I know your schedule is uh, heavily impacted these days. So would you uh, give us kind of an overview of the issues and concerns that you're focusing on as the state works to emerge from the, from the pandemic? Sure, well, first of all, thank you. Um, you know, local elected leaders, Mayor Pete, Mayor Kalmick, uh, have really stepped up to the plate here in the last 15 or 16 months. Uh, and I don't need to tell you how challenging it is, uh, trying to make sure that, that your communities are healthy, uh, both physically healthy and economically healthy. And I know um, both of you have been doing a, a really excellent job. Uh, fortunately, you get paid quite a bit. Um, I'm, I'm being a bit sarcastic here because it, it's, it's God and country that basically you're doing this for and for your communities. And so I'm grateful to you. In terms of, of what we're doing, my, my guess is that, that our uh, priorities are similar to your priorities. You know, the, the first priority of all of us in government is, is to maintain the health of our communities. And so the COVID pandemic is something that is either the backdrop or the overlay to, to virtually everything we've done here in the last 14 months, you know, trying to keep people healthy, trying to deal with those who are sick, uh, trying to deal with the economic consequences, those are all front and center. You know, in terms of, of my contribution, I have um, certain discrete responsibilities in the Senate. I chaired the elections committee uh, prior to now chairing the Judiciary Committee and as chair of the Elections Committee, my job was to make sure that we could have an election in California that, that was safe and allowed as many people who are eligible to vote uh, have the opportunity to vote in a safe way and keeping the employees safe. And so that was a focus of your, if you're asking about my personal focus, that was a focus here for the first couple of years was making sure that we could do that. And I think we did. We had a very, very successful election in terms of the, the turnout uh, last November, November 2020, and in terms of, of keeping people safe. And those were our goals. Um, that continues for this year. We're, we're going to have an election this year that's going to be conducted sometime in the fall. And, you know, our, our challenges, my personal challenge was to make sure that that was a, an election that was both safe and allowed as many people to vote who were eligible to vote and wanted to vote to be able to do so. So that's number one. No, number two is now I chair Judiciary Committee. Judiciary Committee has responsibility for uh, making sure that folks have access to justice so that whether it's a criminal matter or whether it's a, a civil matter, or whether it's a family law matter or a domestic matter, that the people, uh, even during times of pandemic, need to have access to justice. And so that's one of my responsibilities, making sure the courts run as efficiently as is possible, that they have the resources to do so, and they have the tools to do so. And, you know, I, I'd be happy to talk about this a little later, um, that uh, I'm very concerned about the cost of litigation and starting to el costo de reduce the, um, the cost of litigation. El costo de los I think I've got somebody helping me out here. I don't know if, there we yeah. go. Uh, so uh, the, the other issues that we're dealing with, economic, the economic reverberations from, from the pandemic, um, all of us, especially in this portion of Orange County are impacted, uh, for example, by the closure of Disneyland. Uh, the second and third order impacts are immense. And, and, you know, I've had people say, well, you know, we've got some people that are unemployed. It's not just some people who work at Disneyland that were unemployed. It's all the businesses that are dependent upon Disneyland, hotels, restaurants, travel agencies, um, all sorts of second and third order impacts. I have my own uh, bill that 
simply says that if you're a business that couldn't operate during the, the pandemic, that you shouldn't have to pay uh, certain governmental fees. If you're a, a restaurant and a bar, you shouldn't have to pay your ABC license fee if you're not operational. Uh, that, that's one of our contributions. The other contribution is, is providing rental assistance both to tenants, but also to make sure that, that landlords are also able to pay their mortgage uh, during the pandemic. And so that's been another focus of, of uh, the legislature and a focus uh, for my personal sort of activity. Um, I'm sure we're going to discuss housing at some point. Housing crisis is unabated in California, that uh, the cost of housing is astronomic. Uh, those of us who have been here for a long time uh, may, uh, you know, we, we, we uh, are fortunate, but our children are not so fortunate. I have, you know, one of my three children just had a baby here a month ago, and, and, and they would desperately like to buy a house and, and can't do so. Uh, so that, that is a big issue, and, it, and not just for people who wish to buy homes, also for people who wish to, to rent. Um, we're, we're going to face when the eviction moratorium expires, uh, both in the courts as well as economically, uh, in terms of housing, we're going to face a more acute situation here relatively soon. So having said all that, I, am, I, I look at the numbers, and Mayor Pete and Mayor Kalmick, maybe you do every day. I see there are only seven people in ICU today in Orange County. That is fantastic as compared to several months ago where we had 2,500 people who were hospitalized. And, you know, 30 times the number of people are in ICU right now. So, so we are, if, if people uh, continue to take adequate precaution, just use common sense uh, and people get vaccinated, I, I can see the light at the end of the tunnel here, you know, praise the Lord. So anyway, those are, I, I, that, that's sort of a survey course of, of what's going on. Good. Perfect. Well, thank you. Um, John, you had a question. Yes, oh, and congratulations yeah. on your new grandbaby. It's an exciting yeah. phase of life. By the way, I should, I, I, we have in the last, I, I understand that there's a decline in births during the pandemic, and that will have impacts on terms of schools later on. But the Umberg family has done its part because in the last five months, we've had three grandbabies. So. Oh, my goodness. Congratulations. Thanks. <laughs> Your uh, next question we'd have is you're a you're a senior member of the you know the state delegation in Orange County and, and Orange County is a, a mix of both Democrat and Republican leaders and so how is how is your working relationship with the local uh, leaders in in this area? Uh, I, I well this is my third stint in the legislature so I guess by dint of years and color of hair that makes me senior. Uh, <laughs> I I was first elected in 1990. Uh, it, many of your listeners and viewers probably weren't alive in 1990, uh, and then have had significant breaks in service—a 10-year break and a 12-year break. This is my third uh, third stint in the legislature, first time in the in the state senate. Uh, I, um, I I try to work hard to to maintain relationships. I'm I'm hoping that Mayor Kalmick feels like he's got it, uh, an open door to our office and to me. Yes. I know that some cities think they need to hire lobbyists to come and advocate for them. I'm, I'm hopeful that cities that, there are nine cities that I represent, that they don't feel the need necessarily to hire lobbyists, that, that they can you know, knock on my door, call my cell phone at any time. Um, so I take, I take uh, that responsibility of staying in touch very, very seriously with the local elected officials, you folks, are where the rubber meets the road. You're gonna hear about, this, about the concerns earlier than I am, and they're gonna become more acute earlier in your world. Uh, and I realize that you know, stop signs and potholes aren't the first thing that, that we're responsible for, but I wanna hear about that. When, when you have an issue, a local issue that I can help remedy, I wanna hear about it. And so I, I try to stay in close touch. In terms of the other members of the delegation, uh, you're right. Mayor Pete, we, we uh, have a, a broad mix. I, when I was first elected in 1990, I was the only Democrat at any level, supervisor, congressional, legislative level. And so things are, are very different now, but, but 
you know, unlike Washington, D.C., where I, I think things are more polarized um, in the House of Representatives, you know, there are 435 of them. I'm in a house where there's only 40, 40 people. Uh, and so we come into contact with one another all the time, uh, particularly when there's no pandemic. We, we sit next to one another on the floor. We sit next to one another um, in committees all the time. And so uh, the personal animus, I think, doesn't exist like it may other places in government. Um, we have, um, in terms of the state Senate, Senator Min to my south and, and Senator Newman to my east. Um, I see them, I went out to dinner with them the night before last, I see them all the time. And the same thing with, with you know, for example, uh, Senator Bates, we, we, I see, I fly back and forth with Senator Bates and we talk all the time, members of the assembly. We, uh, we see one another quite often. If, you, if you're on the uh, early morning flight on Monday morning or the late afternoon flight on Thursday, you'll see about 10, of, 10 legislators on that plane. So um, I don't know if that answers your question, but uh, yeah. Yes, thank you. Um, Senator, um, many of the, the rules and guidelines during the COVID pandemic have come directly from the governor's office, the governor himself. Um, we saw in recent news that he's uh, chosen not to lift the emergency order so that the governor will likely continue with these policies. Can you give us from your level some insight um, into how that works? And are you able to talk to the governor directly to make sure that your constituents down here are represented? Um, well, there, there's uh, the, uh, the founders, both in Washington and California, they created the different branches of government to, to be uh, checks and balances on one another. So there is a healthy dialogue and sometimes a healthy tension between the, the, the branches of government. Uh, I, I do. Um, I don't hang out with the governor, but I talk to him okay. <laughs> uh, periodically. Uh, the, the, um, the issue uh, of how to deal with an emergency, and you know, I've been around for different emergencies, whether it was the earthquake, um, you know, the Northridge earthquake and other different fires and different emergencies. Um, you do need someone in charge who can make decisions relatively quickly. Um, and we have that. I am very hopeful that as the pandemic recedes and as Californians get vaccinated and, and our communities get healthy, that, that that emergency order will not be required uh, for all that very much longer. Uh, but we are still we are still in a state of emergency. Um, there are still counties, unlike Orange County, who are still uh, really struggling. With, with the pandemic and our economy is still struggling. So uh, this is a, a good question for a political science class as to what that, <laughs> what that relationship is. Uh, we are currently working on a budget with the governor right now. We have some differences of opinion. We will come together here, uh, I think by next Monday on a, on a budget that we all can, or at least the majority of us can agree upon. Great, thank you. Um, I do think, by the way, back back to your question at the beginning, um, I do take concerns uh, to the governor. And, and, you know, one of the things that I have emphasized to the governor, and, and maybe this is a function of the fact that when I was first in the assembly as the only Democrat, I, and, and I felt like Orange County was not treated fairly, is that I am in his ear often about making sure that there is, uh, that, or, that we are treated fairly. Uh, we are treated on an equal basis with other regions of the state. Uh, and that's part of my job. Great, thank you. Uh, a, kind of a, a tangential question that you mentioned the vaccinations. Could you give us an update on the, how things are going uh, across the state? You, we talked uh, briefly that you know, our Orange County counts are way down and, and things are looking very good here in the county, uh, but how are things going uh, around the rest of the state? Uh, 
in general, things are going well. There are some regions of the state where it's not going nearly as well. Uh, you know, we're all facing uh, an issue. I, I also have a business. We're all facing issues as to opening businesses and those who are vaccinated, those who are not vaccinated, those who refuse to get vaccinated, those who can't be vac vaccinated. And, um, you know, I, I personally believe that, that everyone, except for the very, very, very tiny few who medically or perhaps because of a religious issue, can't be vaccinated, but that everybody should get vaccinated. It's not an issue just for their own personal safety. It's an issue for, for my safety, for my kids' safety, and for your safety. Um, and I, I am supportive of the governor's efforts to, and, and our efforts and your efforts to encourage everyone to be vaccinated. We've had our own vaccination clinics uh, that, our, that our office is sponsored. I know you've had vaccination opportunities in your cities. Um, it's it, it's absolutely imperative, and I um, sadly there have been places in Orange County which have disseminated misinformation about both the pandemic as well as vaccinations, and that's that that's harmful, I think, to all of us. Um, you know, we've and there's you know this issue concerning um, whoever coined the term vaccine passport. <laughs> I would really like to talk to because that's done a great disservice to the effort. There's the, 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 that that attaches a moniker to uh, the ability for businesses, including my own, to be able to verify whether people have have been vaccinated or not. And it's not designed. You know, the 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 verification of vaccination is not designed to uh, somehow create two classes of citizens, it's designed to be able to have our, our economy, our schools, our government function efficiently and safely. Great, thank you. Well, so to, to kind of follow up on that, um, Senator, do you, do you think that we do need some form of, of to where someone can demonstrate the fact that they have been vaccinated? Uh, do I, do I, I think, you know, again, I'll, I'll just go back to my business experience. Uh, yes, I, I, we have strongly encouraged both in government, in my, my government job, as well as my business job, strongly, strongly, strongly encourage people to be vaccinated. Um, you know, there is a, uh, an issue, I, I realize that it's not completely resolved as to whether an employer can require employees to be vaccinated. Um, but I think that having an employer have the ability to be able to identify those who are, are and are not vaccinated. Uh, yeah, I think that that's, that's, that's important. And, and the ability to do so is, is dependent upon, you know, either having a vaccination card or some other mechanism to demonstrate that that person has been vaccinated. Great, right, thank you, John. Yes. Um, as the state emerges from the uh, from the pandemic shutdown, and we try to you know reinvigorate our economies, what uh, resources uh, will the state be able to bring to bear to help uh, businesses reopen, especially uh, you know small businesses like yours that have you know really been struggling? Well, so um, I, and if, if folks have not taken uh, the opportunity to apply for various federal and, and state loans, they they should do so. Some. Uh, can be forgiven, depending upon, you know, whether you've maintained your workforce during the during the pandemic or not. Um, I, I think, you know, uh, Joe Kalmick uh, raised the issue of businesses being able to open safely and being assured that they can do so um, with some sort of proof of vaccination. Government providing some opportunity to provide employers that assurance is is, is really important. Um, I think also as, as things become uh, less restrictive is making sure that, that people clearly understand what the rules of the road are. I think all those things are, are really important. You know, one of the things that has been really inspiring to me, and I bet it's the same for the two of you as well, is to see so many businesses that really, really stepped up 
during the pandemic. Mm -hmm. I mean, it just, it, it, you know, some businesses, restaurants, for example, that had to shut down, but would reopen, you know, periodically to be able to feed people that with their volunteers, their employee employees who now are no longer working, coming back to volunteer to provide food distribution with other businesses changing their, their business from manufacturing alcohol to manufacturing um, hand sanitizers, other businesses that have, you know, maintained, done the very best they can to maintain their workforce uh, while taking a hit to their bottom line. I mean, I, I, I just, I am really moved by so many businesses that have done that. And those businesses should be rewarded. Now, there's a very, very small number of businesses and, and I'll underline very small number who have, for whatever reason, decided to thumb their nose at, at, at the pandemic. You know, businesses that advertise, you may not wear a mask in our business. Businesses that have said, you know, you may not socially distance you know, as some sort of a political statement. Uh, sadly, they've gotten a lot of attention, um, and that that those those folks shouldn't get rewarded here um, as we emerge from the pandemic. Okay, um, as as the co chair of the pandemic recovery committee, what resources, more specifically, do you think the state? Um, you know, can can bring to bear here to help the residents and the businesses recover. Yeah, I, I you may have just promoted me there, there, Joe. I, I'm I'm not co-chair. I think I'm a member of the, of oh. the committee. So, um, the the current co-chairs would would take offense at that. But but, <laughs> but uh, right. so uh, there there are and and. By the way, if we haven't posted it, we should post our, our phone number and the way to get a hold of our office. But but as I mentioned before, there are there are loans and other resources provided to businesses to to keep them operational. Um, there are there's rental assistance and there's also um, the rental assistance has two benefits. One, it's a benefit to landlords. I, I am, you know, most landlords are, aren't. Uh, don't don't own and operate you know a thousand unit operation most landlords have you know maybe four units or three units or two units and i am mindful of the fact that if, if you know landlord if the tenants aren't paying rent they can't pay their mortgage and that has that has some dramatic implications for for them personally and for our economy generally and so uh, there, there are a lot of folks that are not taking advantage of the rental assistance program I, i'm not quite sure why. I don't know if it's too complicated or not. Um, you know, one of the things that is an embarrassment to those of us in state government in particular, but I think in government in general, is the um, EDD. You know, if you've been unemployed and trying to seek, you know, your, uh, your, your rightful benefit, uh, unemployment benefits, that has to be, that absolutely has to be remedied. Um, I have my own concerns about its functionality, but I also have some of my own concerns about the, the amount of fraud that ensued. Um, and uh, I'm, I've authored a bill for us to be able to uh, take a look at, at restitution, going after those who have defrauded the taxpayers and seeing what we can do to uh, recover that. I know that lots of that money is gone, but even if we only recover 10%, that may be as much as, you know, Four or five billion dollars, and four or five billion dollars is actual money. So, you uh, you mentioned is in your opening uh, comments uh, some of the things that the uh, state you know that you're considering about uh, taxation of businesses or not taxing uh, uh, businesses, say for their ABC license fee or things like that. Are there any additional items you'd like to highlight that the the state will be you know, yeah. looking at to uh, help businesses? So, well, you, you raise the issue of taxes. Uh, the, I realize that some of my colleagues have proposed additional taxes. Uh, for me, that's a non-starter for a bunch of reasons. Uh, one is that when we're trying to get the economy back on its feet, that, that is not the time to further tax either individuals or businesses, number one. Number two is that... Uh, 
contrary to our expectations a year ago, uh, based on a number of different things. The fact that, that high income earners haven't really suffered all that much during the pandemic, and, and we're heavily dependent on high income earners in California for our revenue. Uh, and we've been the beneficiaries of uh, federal support that, that we don't need to raise taxes. Uh, you know, there's an argument about how much money we've received from the federal government and how much money we've collected in terms of tax re revenues. There's an argument about that, but there's no argument that's much greater than we expected a, a year ago. And so um, now is the time for, for us to allow entrepreneurs, to allow businesses to, to the extent that they are recovering, to reinvest back in their business, not to uh, not tax them. Any, any, in any greater amount than they're already being taxed. Um, on, on another subject, uh, the reopening of schools. Uh, you know, this is going to be very critical uh, for this year for so many reasons. Um, you know, many of the schools are still operating, you know, virtually. And, uh, you know, it's very fractious. I mean, in terms of one school district wants to be you know, totally back in, in business and others are hesitating. Um, is, there, is there anything, you know, in the, in the Senate going on that would help to ensure uh, that all the schools are ready to be able to reopen in the fall? And then how, is there any plan that you know of or how are we gonna deal with the, the disparities between uh, the education that has been offered during the pandemic, you know, how do we realign so so all of our, our students are going to be at the same basic level overall? Yeah. Um, there are some issues that are really, really difficult. And this is an issue that's really, really difficult and really, really important. Um, I am blessed with a great deal of diversity in the district I represent. It goes from Santa Ana, Garden Grove, Anaheim, all the way through Seal Beach, Fountain Valley, Westminster, Huntington Beach, up into Long Beach. And so there's disparity and there's a difference between both the you know, majority ethnicity um, as well as wealth. And school districts have, as you point out, have uh, adopted different models. Uh, we, uh, just as I've been inspired by local leaders like you guys stepping up to the plate, I've been inspired by um, school teachers, administrators, board members in large part. There are always exceptions to that rule who have done the very best they can. Uh, I personally, and, and as you may know, that there's a huge incentive to reopen as of April 15th. There's a, a, an incentive for schools to reopen the, the state provides, I forgot the exact amount of money um, to each school district proportionate to the number of students, but a huge amount of money to incentivize schools to reopen as of April 15th. Some school districts have not done that. I, this is my own personal point of view, is I believe that, that schools can open safely um, with, the, with appropriate precautions, that schools, you know, with you know, hand washing and, and masks and vaccinations and those kinds of things, especially now that 12 year olds and above can get vaccinated, that, that they can reopen and that they, they, they in fact should reopen. Um, so, and I'm doing what I can to, to encourage them to do so. We have uh, learned some lessons here in the pandemic. Special ed is really hard to be able to do remotely. And, and I have tremendous sympathy for parents who are trying to address the, the needs of, of children who are traditionally in special ed, because it's almost impossible to do remotely. Um, the issues of uh, socialization for young people, very important. I, I know from, I mentioned my grandchildren, and we all draw from our own personal experience. I have a 11-year-old granddaughter who's in fifth grade. Her mother, because of some medical issues, they've had to be really, really, really careful during the, the pandemic. 
And so she has not been able to see other kids here for a year, really. Mm -hmm. And so when, when we invited her, as we've done before, to come down to Orange County, live in the Bay Area for a couple of weeks and bring a friend, and, and she's done that before. And I said, you know, Ellie, you got to come back down to Orange County, come back to our, you know, Orange County for a couple of weeks. And, and she's, I said, bring a friend. She said, Opa, I don't have any friends. Um, and, and that, you know, that's like a spear through a, a parent or a grandparent's heart and is a consequence of, of what's going on. So back to your question about opening schools. Uh, yeah, we, I, it's my personal point of view that, that we can do so, we can do so safely, that we've learned some lessons about socialization. We've learned some lessons about special ed. We've learned some lessons about remote learning. We've learned some valuable lessons that some, certain things can be done more efficiently remotely and that we can draw upon resources that we might not otherwise have access to uh, if, we use, if we use remote learning. Uh, We've learned that you know there are a lot of people that don't have internet connection. Uh, most school districts have done a good job with hardware. We've learned that that there are a tremendous number of students that are on free and reduced price breakfasts and lunches, and that you know when you close down schools, that there's food insecurity that has to be dealt with. Uh, if that's your primary point of of uh, sustenance for some school kids and, and the school closes down that's the, that's a big issue and and luckily school districts have been very innovative and ingenious in, in addressing that but anyway that's i'm sorry for such a long-winded answer but this is a huge huge question yeah. that, that i know all of us you know whether you're in, on city council or whether you're in the state legislature or you're on a school board it's of concern to everybody Definitely. Yes, my wife is the president of the Cypress Elementary District, so we we live this every day. Well, Talking yes, you do. Her. Well, well, you have to thank her too for from our perspective. Yeah, we'll do. Thank you. I'm going to uh, skip the question we had on EDD because you've yeah. already addressed EDD. I'm going to move to the aerospace and defense question because I retired from uh, 30 years at Raytheon a couple of years ago and uh, would ask, what is the what is the aerospace and defense uh, committee doing? You know, as we see uh, companies choosing to relocate operations, what are we doing to keep that great industry here in in Southern California or in California in general? Well, thank you, Mayor. Offline, we'll have to do a who you know. My my brother in law is a twenty five year employee, and my nephew is a three year employee of, of Raytheon. Okay. So, uh, and. Uh, so one of the big challenges is Boeing. Boeing is, a, is an employer, was a much larger employer of our local workforce here. And whether it is uh, using our own personal initiative to, to keep Boeing here, you know, one of the, again, one of the challenges with entities like Raytheon or Boeing is housing prices that it is really hard if you have a facility in Seal Beach or in Huntington Beach um, and you, you have employees that are, you know, sort of, if you, you have employees that make $70,000 a year, they can't find a house. They, they, they're living in the Inland Empire and then they find other employment. So that, that is a huge issue, number one. Number two is, making sure that to the extent that businesses want to expand their footprint, that we not impose um, extraordinary burdens upon them. Um, we we want to make sure that we're all environmentally sensitive, but that that CEQA doesn't become a huge impediment to uh, businesses who, that want to expand their footprint. That applies to housing in some respects as well. Uh, so, um, those are some of the things, you know, whether or not we provide some sort of uh, uh, state um, incentives for businesses to, to stay here. Um, that's, that's a question that, that is before us and, and how we provide those incentives and those kinds of things. I mean, one of the benefits that we have is that, you know, you represent uh, beautiful areas. And, you know, I, I came to California from the Midwest and um, I can't imagine wanting to move back to the Midwest and that we, we do have wonderful climate and geography here, which will remain. Uh, we just have to make sure that, that we don't um, make it too difficult to do business here so that we, uh, 
that, that we lose the economic edge that we have. Thank you. Um, back to a COVID re related question. You know, in recent reports, there have been basically zero COVID related deaths, um, depending on the day in Orange County. And so could we at this point declare the pandemic to be largely over? Uh, and what do you see as the long-term changes that are gonna be permanent as a result of the pandemic in terms of how we live and how we conduct business and so forth? Well, you're, you're right. And I, as I mentioned earlier, I, I check the COVID numbers every day. I, I think there are seven in ICU today, which is the lowest we've had probably in a year. Uh, and, and credit goes to lots and lots of, uh, lots and lots of folks, uh, you know, the healthcare officials, both governmental and non-governmental healthcare officials have really done an excellent job under difficult circumstances. E even though we're at record low numbers in Orange County, um, we're gonna we're opening Disneyland, so we're gonna have visitors coming from other places. Uh, we've got you know wonderful beaches, so we we attract folks coming from other areas. So we can't quite declare this, we can't quite declare victory quite yet. We need to still be mindful, and I am concerned that if people believe that somehow, you know, hey, I don't need to get vaccinated, it looks like everything's resolved. That's a that's a big problem. So so keeping our eye on the ball. Number one, what what did we learn in the pandemic? Um, uh, well, <laughs> we've learned that, that some of our systems don't work as well as they need to. Uh, some of our healthcare systems don't work as well as they need to in a crisis, and and we got to learn from that. We got to learn from you know the shortage of PPE at the beginning of the crisis. We got to learn from the ability to work remotely. All of us are on Zoom right now this is actually kind of cool. Yeah. I, um, I, I am a little zoomed out from phone, from, from Zoom meetings. You're probably zoomed out as well. But I mean, here we are. Um, I'm sitting in the Capitol in Sacramento. You're in Orange County. We're talking to lots of people. Um, traditionally, we would do this, you know, at a, you know, at a function in Cyprus or a function in, in Seal Beach. Uh, and so this, this is a learning experience that allows us to, to touch base with lots more people and, and communicate lots more effectively. Uh, so so that's, that's a plus. Um, people have learned to work at home. Um, I, I, you know, I, even though I'm only 39 years old, um, that, that I'm actually, again, being a little sarcastic, only a little bit sarcastic. Uh, that I'm not a I, I I I'm used to working in an office. I'm used to working in a workspace. Um, you know, I I have difficulty uh, focusing if I'm not in in a in a workspace. But apparently, lots of millennials don't have that same difficulty. Lots of younger people don't have that same difficulty, mm -hmm. and can be equally as productive at home. Maybe even more productive at home than than they can be in an office. And so, you know, we, we're in my own business where we, we just expanded, just got a bunch of additional office space that, that now I, I look and although we have employees, if they came in, they could fill those offices. Uh, they're not, and they, then they probably won't come in as often, um, but they seem to be just as productive. So those are some of the things that we've learned. And, and I think some of the things that will be, will be permanent. We'll see what happens to the commercial real estate market here in Orange County. Um, I don't know. I'm curious as to what you guys think. What do you think the permanent changes? What 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 have you experienced both in government and in private sector? Well, from from my perspective, I mean, the most obvious um, permanent changes are the ability to uh, to work remotely and to meet remotely. And I think that as we go back to uh, you know. In your own case, you see that you don't necessarily have a need to have uh, new employees um, necessarily working either at all or some of the time, um, you know, 
uh, at, at an office. And, and I think that, uh, I think we'll wind up with kind of a hybrid um, system for, um, you know, government meetings. I mean, yes, we're, we very much want to go back to uh, having open city council meetings where the public can actually be there. Many would fe who feel, feel uncomfortable uh, um, working in a Zoom situation or emailing, you know, their questions and so forth. Um, so I think that, uh, uh, but having instead of a of a group, whether it's a SCAG, you know, meeting, uh, or a council of mayors, you know, instead of having to drive, you know, one, you know, some people are going to have to drive many miles, and with the ever congestion, you know, a mounting congestion, you know, we're going to have to leave an hour and a half to get to a meeting that's a, an hour when all we have to do is, uh, you know put a sport coat and a suit over my Bermuda shorts and, uh, you know, and are part of a, of a formalized meeting. In terms of the restaurant uh, industry, I think we'll see um, hygienic changes. Um, you know, we may find that uh, servers will be wearing gloves. I mean, uh, anything that in, along that line, and I, I think will be permanent. Yeah, we're seeing in our business park a, a real increase in demand for uh, storage, warehousing space, and much less demand for uh, office space, as you mentioned. So uh, we're going to be looking at uh, our our zoning codes for our business parks to see if we can accommodate, you know, increasing the use of those spaces for the businesses that really want to be there. Yeah, the. Um... You know, you, you had asked about some other lessons learned. You know, what one of the things I'm carrying a bill uh, that is really a product of the pandemic to allow folks to buy and lease cars electronically. So you don't have to go into the dealership. Um, and, you know, uh, personally, I, I think that that may be a benefit. You, you can sit and look at the contract, you know, in the sort of the confines of your home, take as long as you want to sort of mull over whether you actually want, you know, additional, you know, fill in the blank. Uh, but you can't do that right now. You can't, you can't buy a, a car with electronic, you know, signatures, electronic document transmission, which is, you know, the pandemic highlights why we need to, to modernize that process. Uh, I, mentioned at the outset, I chair the Judiciary Committee and I, you know, one of my professions is being a lawyer. And uh, those of you who have been in court or been around courts, it's a very inefficient process, very, very inefficient and as a consequence, very expensive. And so I have, a, I have a bill that allows witnesses, some witnesses to testify remotely. So you don't have to sit in the hallway for a day and a half waiting to testify and and, and so you don't have to miss work waiting to testify. Um, that's somewhat controversial, Bill. Uh, but but it, it is, again, a product of a lesson we learned during the pandemic that everybody doesn't need to necessarily testify in a live setting. I have a bill that says that courts have to send out notices uh, electronically. There are some courts in California that still mail everything. Now, that seems crazy, um, but it is. So we're, you know, we're, 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 these are lessons we've learned during the pandemic is that we have to do certain things more efficiently and we have the infrastructure to do it. We have the infrastructure to have, for example, every court delivered notices electronically, uh, or we should if we don't. And we have the infrastructure to have witnesses, some witnesses at least testify remotely. Um, again, lessons learned. Senator, uh, we greatly appreciate your time. We've reached the end of the, uh, the time that we've scheduled. I'm sure we have more questions we'd love to discuss, but want to respect the time and thank you again for uh, spending uh, time with us uh, today answering some of these questions. And I, uh, I just want to let uh, remind everybody that we have a, uh, a vaccination clinic on Tuesday, June 16th, here at the Los Alamitos uh, race course, and then again, on Tuesday, July 6th, there'll be a, uh, another clinic. So anyone can show up, It's uh, you can come uh, as you are, as long as there are supplies, or you can schedule an appointment through the Athena.com system.
Well, thank you, Mayor, and thank you all for, for doing your part during the pandemic. Uh, I'll conclude where I began by saying that, that you inspire me, you inspire us to do our jobs better because of the, your dedication. So thanks so much. All right. Thanks, to Tom. All right. Great. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, John. You bet. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.